Choose Linux, episode 22, for November 14th, 2019. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Joe. I'm Drew. And I'm Mel. And here we are for episode 22. And we'll be doing Distro Hoppers next time with Void Linux. I must say, so far, my experience hasn't been all that positive. But I'm determined to persevere, Joe. I'm going to do it. It's going to happen. <laughs> okay, well, we'll look forward to that for next time. But this time we're going to be talking about what to do next after choosing Linux. So you get into Linux, you install it. Then what? There's a whole community out there. How do you get involved? And I think this is a topic that I'm really excited for us to talk about because I've been kind of a digital nomad, if that's an okay phrase to steal, and just trying to find not only just one community, but a different variety of communities, whether it comes to Linux or open source or containers that I can not only contribute to, but that they can help me grow. So I don't know, I have somebody that has really, I guess, benefited from taking that next step. Well, so where do you start, though? What is like the number one step to finding a good community for you? The big difference for me has been making the commitment to show up to a meetup and do it religiously. Like, I will be here every single meetup for the next three months, but I'm not just going to show up and stand in the back of the room. I'm going to walk in, I'm going to introduce myself to people, and I'm going to tell them why I'm there. Okay, so I like that, and I'm curious, how would I go about finding a meetup that is right for me? Maybe that's the the part that everybody gets the hang up on, is it's finding the meetup that's right for you. And I think the first step is just find the meetup. Find the meetup, show up, you know, have interactions with people, experience it, not just once, because the first time is always a little awkward. You don't know anyone. So make that commitment to go in a couple of times and develop a rapport with people before deciding whether you want to continue there or not. It's hands-on experience that's going to tell you whether it's for you or not. Now, it used to be that for Linux, you had lugs, Linux user groups. Is that still a thing? It's not really in London, I don't think. It wasn't until I heard about you know Linux Unplugged before I joined you guys that I'd even heard what a lug was. So I'm not sure the communities might still be around, but I'm not sure the phrase is used anymore. I went looking for a local lug a couple of weeks ago, and there used to be one in Savannah, but these days there aren't any. I'm not entirely sure that any kind of user group exists in my area. So I'm wondering, with the internet being so prevalent and being where so many people flock to these days for, you know, interacting with like-minded individuals, are in-person meetups in at least smaller cities just a thing of the past? Is Joe, you said that you're not finding any in London. Maybe it's true for bigger cities as well. Well, I said that there's not a lug anymore that's active in London, but there are plenty of meetups. So honest question from ignorance here, what's the difference? That's a very good question. I think the difference is that logs were more formal and you'd go somewhere and you'd have talks and it'd just be a bit more organized. Whereas a meetup can just be, hey, let's meet in a restaurant or in a bar or a coffee shop and just hang out and talk Linux or not even sometimes just talk about whatever. So at a log, they'll probably keep minutes and have kind of a structured flow to everything, right? Whereas a meetup is a little more informal and a little more maybe jovial and unstructured? Well, a lot less formal, I would say. I don't know. That just doesn't sound like something I would want to do. You know, I'm, I'm going to meetups because I want to be able to discuss subjects that I'm currently learning. I want to be able to have conversations that are pertinent to what's going on with me. And it sounds like if I had a lug where I'm like, okay, we're going to talk about topic A, B, and C, I'd feel almost hesitant to disrupt what they'd already had planned and maybe be less likely to go back if I didn't if I couldn't relate to what was going on. Well, that may go some way to explaining why lugs have basically evolved into meetups then. Let me tell you a little bit about my favorite meetup and how it kind of sounds a little bit like what you're talking about with a lug. And it's the Dallas Hackers meetup. And they meet inside of a Korean karaoke bar. And every single different room will have a different kind of subject that people are talking about. And you can just show up and you get up and you tell them what you're learning, what you're working on. And it just kind of kicks off the conversation. So if I don't like 
the conversation in room A, I just jump over to room B or B, room C. It's a way to have multiple conversations and the same group of people being able to interact. Okay, that sounds like a lot of fun. I wonder if there are any near me. I'd probably have to see what's in Atlanta, which is you know like a four-hour drive, but that might be worth it for uh, for an evening. Drew, your comment really kind of took me back a moment with what I always tell people because everybody's always looking for another meetup that's already being established or looking to find a group and they don't stop to think about, hey, maybe you could start one. And it doesn't have to be anything formal. I mean, I have a meetup that I run once a month here in San Antonio that started with two of us sitting down and saying, hey, I'm going to learn to pick locks. Does anybody else want to join? And it's slowly grown. We have 25 people that show up now. No formal talks or anything other than, hey, this is just a group of people that get together once a month. We eat some tacos, we pick some locks, and other people just happen to bring their projects. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. I could probably put something together. Savannah is growing in the technical industry, so I'm sure there are people out there who would be interested. That could be a lot of fun. Yeah, and even if you end up just having a talk and a drink or a meal or whatever with one or two other like-minded people, if it's local, then it's got to be worth it, right? Yeah. It reminds me of when I was in college. I used to take my dog to the dog park there uh, twice a week or so. And there was one day each week that there would be like three or four other Linux users at the dog park. And we would all kind of cluster together and have our own little Linux powwow just right there at the dog park. It was never scheduled. It was never really formal, but it, it kind of sounds like what you're talking about, L. And I haven't really found that sense, but certainly I could try to recreate it somehow. The way that mine started was me just tweeting about, hey, you know, I'm trying to install Linux on this Mac. I think we all remember that episode. I need help. I'm going to be at this coffee house. Anyone want to meet up? And then later on, you know, hey, I'm doing this. I'm going to be here. But what I learned is if I do it consistently, so, you know, on a certain day every month or on a certain day every week, people kind of start planning around it. And I start getting a lot more participation, especially if they know I'm going to be there no matter what. I think one of the reasons that meetups tend to fail or maybe even lugs is people stop showing up. And eventually you get that one guy who's brand new who shows up and no one is there. But what would your advice be to someone who doesn't really have the confidence to organize it themselves? Maybe fake it till you make it? No, uh, try it online. You know, I, I think both of you were really instrumental in helping me set up the study groups here at Jupiter Broadcasting because before I got brave enough to do this in person, I thought, well, you know, what if I just did it over the podcast? And then I got a little braver and it was, okay, what if we met on Twitch? And eventually I got brave enough that I was like, all right, I'm just going to meet people in real life. So it wasn't just, you know, overnight. It was a slow growth and progression to get there. Or let's say that, you know what, you're just not there. You don't want to do it online. You don't want to put the meetup together. Then there are plenty of conferences all over the world that are happening. Just buy your ticket and go meet some new people. Or there are some that are actually free, like OGCAMP, which is pay what you want. And that includes nothing. That's a, an annual conference here in the UK that I've just been to, which is kind of broader than just Linux. But there are a lot of Linux users there. I think it goes back to where there's a will, there's a way. For example, the tickets for Texas Cyber Summit were in the hundreds, and that wasn't in my budget. So I emailed them and said, hey, um, can I help you guys move tables and do setup and breakdown in exchange for a ticket? And that's how I got involved with that conference. As somebody who's never actually been to a proper conference, what would be the way for me to find one to go to? Would it be geographical, like just find the one closest to me and sign up? Or should I be looking for one that specifically targets my interests and really my specialties? Yes. No, <laughs> <laughs> I think it really goes to what are your end goals? If your end goal is career development and perhaps networking, then definitely stick to the conference that fits that criteria. However, if your goal is just to meet other people, to build a community, to grow your own personal network, not your you know company-based or job-based network, then talk to other people near you, talk to friends, they don't even have to live near you, and find out what conferences they've been to, what conferences are perhaps the most open. Um, we've all gone to Linux Fest Northwest, and I can tell you that you can just sit down and start talking to someone, and they're really open for that. So that might be worth the plane ticket and the hotel room to be able to just be in the middle of that community. 
There is a real difference, though, between community conferences like Linux Fest Northwest and then some of the more, well, career-oriented ones that you've been to, right? Yes and no. I mean, I feel like I'm being so wish-washy, but it really is what you make out of it. You know, when I would first start going to conferences, especially the more corporate ones, I wouldn't talk to anyone. I would just attend every talk and I would sit and I would take notes and I would just go home with this binder full of things to Google. And that wasn't really growing me and it wasn't growing my career. So people started telling me about hallway tracks. And it's where, you know what, you grab the speaker afterwards and you say, hey, I have a few questions. And they sit down and they start talking to you about it. Or perhaps you sit down at a table with someone and you just start going, hey, I went to this talk. And it's all about just starting that conversation so that you can start networking and meeting people with similar interest. So for a first time attendee like me, do you think that it would be best to do like a mix of the hallway track and going to different talks, just kind of see what sparks my interest and go with whatever works? Or would you recommend trying to attend talks first and then circle back to a hallway track after I've done that a little bit? What What do you think a newcomer's uh, strategy should be for attending these conferences? I'm going to tell you the way that I do it, and don't judge me, okay? Because it's going to sound horrible, but it is the way that I honestly do it. I print out the schedule, old school paper. I have three highlighters. I highlight the talks that I have to go in. The one that I'm just like, I love this speaker. I am super interested in this topic, whatever it is, and I'll highlight that. The second color is... Eh, kind of interested in it, but if a good conversation is going on, I don't mind missing it. I'll catch the recording. And the third one is, well, there's nothing else going on. I might as well tackle something new. Yeah, that's kind of how I do it, but I'm not as organized as you. I don't have uh, highlighters and stuff. I just look at my phone and see what's coming up next and what I fancy. But when I first started going to conferences, it was all about the talks because I didn't know anyone. And so I would just go and see as many talks as possible and just choose the most interesting ones and maybe ask a couple of questions at the end where they have the the question section, but otherwise didn't really talk to that many people. And it was kind of a bit awkward, really. And it was only really through my involvement in the podcasting community that I ended up meeting more people. And now when I go, I see very, very few talks and end up just completely doing the hallway track almost. Do you find that you end up doing more hallway track these days than L? I think the more that I've gotten involved with the community, I end up doing it because people are asking me questions. And it's funny, I think I've gone full circle because now I'm like, I, I want to answer this. I want to help you out, but I'm ready to learn more. So I have five talks that I really want to get to. And I kind of awkward penguin myself into getting away from people so I can make the talk. So maybe that's just you know, the ebbs and flow of the journey as you are looking to learn new things and as you're looking to build your network. For people who are getting ready to attend their first conferences, uh, maybe they are interested in potentially presenting as well as attending. Joe, I know you recently gave a talk for the first time. Do you have any suggestions for people who are looking for that kind of experience? Yeah, definitely don't do any practice at all. Just wing it and it'll be completely (laughs) fine. Spoken like a true professional. (laughs) Well, I actually did very little practice and totally got away with it. I don't know how. Maybe it's the podcasting experience, but you told me, Al, that I should definitely practice it. And I was just like, no, it'll be fine. And it was fine. Womp womp. Don't listen to him, guys. I'm I'm sure he was just sweating and practicing in his car the whole way there. (laughs) No, I was quite nervous about it, I must say. Um, But then as soon as I started, it was fine because I was expecting to be talking to a tiny audience of like two or three people but it was it was a small room but it was packed so that was handy i think having good slides and i had thought through it i'd I'd thought through exactly what i was going to say i didn't completely wing it but i also i didn't stand in front of the mirror and talk through the whole thing but that's something you do right al the very first time that i give a talk like i never write it out like a script no but i do go through and present the whole talk to myself in the mirror so that I can watch my transitions and I can time where I should be on each slide. I've been to far too many talks where the speaker runs out of time before they run out of slides or talks where they speak so quickly that a 45-minute talk is delivered in 15. (laughs) So I always advise people to go through it at least once so that they know, you know what, at slide 15, I should be at 30 minutes. 
I think my advice would be start with a lightning talk because they can be as little as five minutes and it's much easier to prepare five minutes and much easier to practice it. Did you start with lightning talks? Unfortunately, I started at conferences because I was part of my job and I was teaching. So my very first conference talk was to about 75 people and it was 45 minutes in length. Wow. Um, so I definitely would not recommend starting there. That was trial by fire. Um, one of the, the ones that they do now are, what are they, like Ignite Talks, I believe is the name of them, where it's auto progression of uh, slides and you have like five minutes to talk in. So I like those for people to start out with because anyone can speak about something that they're passionate about for five minutes. I mean, if you do an introduction, you're down to four minutes and then you do a conclusion, you're down to three minutes. So it's an easy way to start. For people who want to go to conferences professionally, but maybe their job doesn't necessarily see it as a benefit, what advice do you have for them to get their employers to see conferences as a real benefit to what they do? The way that I would approach it might not work for everyone, but I think that I would definitely start going to conferences on my own without seeking, you know, find the weekends, find the days, burn some PTO so that you can see what it is that you're benefiting from it. And then be able to have a real conversation with management saying, like, I want to do conference why. The reason that I want to do it is because I want to grow in and then talk about the business case. Like, what is it that you want to grow that would apply to your job? And then be able to talk about how you've gone to other conferences and the way that it's already benefited. Something that they can see, whether that's your confidence, whether that's something that you put into place at work. It's going to be easier to convince them to either spend the money or spend the time if you can already show personal growth because of it. Yeah, and remember that there's those meetups we talked about, which are community organized, generally free, much less formal, and maybe start there and, and see what you can learn and the people you can meet and the ideas that you can come up with from that and apply that to your job. And then maybe kind of leverage that into going to the more professional paid for conferences. I think that's a great idea. And you actually just reminded me of something else that I recently had someone do in that go to whatever meetup it is or go to whatever conference it is that you want to and then write a brown bag to bring back and to teach your team about it. I mean, that was a real hands-on practical way to show this is what I learned and I'm able to bring it back to my work. And it was something that really helped them just kind of stand out with their management. What exactly is a brown bag? Oh, sorry. So a brown bag is a presentation that you do over lunch to your teammates. And they call it a brown bag because they would have their little brown bag lunch there. Ah, I see. So kind of a mini presentation that summarizes what you've learned and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's a way to bring back value uh, to your entire team, not just yourself. All right. Well, I am definitely excited to attend my first real conference now. And I'm also really interested in finding more like-minded people in my area to maybe sit down and have a beer, have a coffee, do whatever, and just do some kind of meetup. But what about the people who are shy and don't necessarily want to meet in person? I mean, we all know that there are plenty of places online for people to do these kinds of things. Uh, what do you guys find is the best place to find other folks online. So a lot of the local meetups that are in San Antonio run message boards or, you know, either on meetup or actual Slack communities that kind of keep people in touch with one another between the physical meetups. I think those have been great resources for me because I can ask a question. I don't have to wait till I can get around to going back to the meetup. And it's let me join and meet people in a less, I want to say, stressful way. So, for example, I've put on that I'm working on X and somebody will say, hey, we can meet, you know, at the local coffee house. Or somebody will throw in, I'm in town. Would anybody like to grab lunch? And two and three people will show up and they'll have lunch without that kind of formality of going to a meetup. So that's been a great way for me to meet people that are new to Linux and wanting to ask questions or people who I've ended up having mentor me and when I try to tackle something new. Yeah, but you live in Texas, so you basically have to be outside most of the time. <laughs> Whereas if you live somewhere cold, you just don't want to leave the house at all. You just want to kind of do it all online, at least in the winter. 
You know, earlier today, when I was working on trying to do a little bit of Python, I was in Slack just asking a question about the way that a loop worked, and somebody just offered to jump into a Zoom call and whiteboard it for me. So there, there's a will, there's a way, Joe. That's, I guess, the, the message that I'm trying to impart here. <laughs> well, and I know that a lot of individual projects are hosting a lot of their community discussion on Discord these days. So... That certainly seems like a place where you can meet like-minded individuals, at least people who tend to use the same apps that you do, and might be a good place to really foster some of those relationships. So there's all these different places and communication channels online. How do you find the welcoming ones? Do you just try them and see? A little bit of trial and error. As I've kind of grown myself in the community, one thing that I personally look for is organizations that have a code of conduct. Now, obviously, you're not going to find that, you know, on Twitter um, in, you know, InfoSec Twitter is just this huge community. They're not going to have a code of conduct that they run by. But smaller groups, for example, ones that run Discord groups or that run invite only Slack channels, a lot of those will have a code of conduct and they'll have outlined what should occur if a violation happens. And I find that those are just more welcoming places because it's already been established what that community should be looking to foster. One way that I've always found communities to really jump into is I will start with a question. Like, I'm having an issue with X, and so I'll go out and I'll do a Google search, or I will just try to find an answer, and all of a sudden I'm in a community forum or a subreddit that I didn't know existed or something along those lines, and... I'm talking to people that I wouldn't have encountered otherwise and making friends. So a lot of times for me, it's just having a problem to solve will lead me in a direction and lead me to find other folks. If you're having a problem with extra, you should definitely try Wayland. (laughs) (laughs) But what about those nastier places? How do you know what to avoid? You know, I think there is a dark subset no matter where you go. Um, I don't want to be the negative person. And I'm always afraid of talking about it because it is kind of the diversity flag. But being a woman in tech definitely makes me weary about showing up to random places and random conferences or just having random DM conversations with people because I cannot tell you how many things I've seen that I didn't want to see or how many messages I've received that I didn't want to receive. So. Unfortunately, I I hate to say it, but I think it's just part of the game. And I've learned to be really quick to block, not to try to continue to have conversations when they've gone in a direction that I don't want them to. And I imagine it would be the same thing um, even if you're not going to that place, even if you're talking about just somebody being extremely contradictory, even if you're talking about somebody just being a naysayer, then just don't talk to the person. Most chat functions have the ability to block that individual user and you can keep on with your day. It's not worth that stress. Yeah, I found that there are some places that I just completely avoid. And I think it's just experience, isn't it? You you go there, you see what it's like. And if you don't like that channel or that forum or where, whatever it is, that website, just don't go back there. Don't be sucked into the negativity or the hatred or whatever it is that is there that you don't like, because there's always somewhere else that you can find another community to talk to. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. There have certainly been some communities where I have backed out of quickly just based on reading certain posts or realizing that the air in the room was kind of toxic. You have much better things to do with your life than to try to, I don't know, change the communities when they're that far gone, when there are others out there that are going to treat you much better. Yeah, sometimes just the avatars will do it for me. You you can just (laughs) kind of tell what kind of place it is from the avatars that people have. You know, one of my mentors once told me that someone convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. And that was like, don't don't bother. Don't waste your breath. You know, if somebody wants to have an actual conversation, then they're going to have it. But if they're just preaching to you, just walk away. I know we've done a lot of talking about ways that, you know, Joe, how you and I have contributed, Drew, about trying to find your meetups. But why? 
What have you gotten out of going to conferences or being a part of a meetup that you think would be beneficial to other people? Why should people show up? Well, I got a career out of it in podcasting, pretty much like the, through the connections that I made by going to physical meetups and also staying in touch with people online. I, there's no doubt that that helped me in my goal of doing this podcasting thing full time. So that and also great friendships. And I've learned tons more about Linux. There's just so many good things about it. And going back to my old dog park talks, I just learned a lot from being around other people who were not necessarily doing the exact same things that I was doing and didn't have the exact same use cases and hearing about their experiences and wanting to replicate some of that in my own life. And it led me to try things like Ubuntu back when Ubuntu was a very young project and get to see it grow because of that early exposure, I think was very beneficial for me. So really just being around people who are also in the community and using Linux really is a great, great thing if it's something that you're passionate about. Well, yeah, just being in a room with people where you don't have to explain what Linux is. There's just that assumed knowledge. They know what Linux is. They know what certain technologies are. And it just allows you to feel comfortable and not quite so weird. Like, well, I speak for myself here, like I do with kind of non-techie people. And even beyond that, I have found that I have really understood things better when I'm not sitting in front of a computer screen, but talking about these technologies with people just live and not even having a laptop open. There's some kind of strange disconnect in my brain where I can really get stuff a little better if I'm not looking directly at it. I think both of you have hit the nail on the head there when you're talking about people. For me, it was being able to see the other side of the coin. Uh, where I was working was very toxic. I hated Linux. I hated the community. I just thought they were so negative, and I would never be good enough to be a part of it. But by going to meetups and joining open source communities and talking to other people outside of that area with Linux, I found a family. I found people who were willing to sit down and show me how NFS worked and were willing to you know, provide mentorship when I needed it, guidance when I needed it, and a place to just get up and yell about how it wasn't fair if I needed that. So meetups have let me continue on with Linux when I didn't think it was for me. Well, we'd better wrap it up there. And remember, you can go to choose slash subscribe for all the ways to get future episodes and choose linux.show slash contact for ways to get in touch with us. And you can find all of us on Twitter as well. I'm at Drew of Doom. And I'm at L underscore O underscore punk at L O punk. And I'm at Joe Rissington. We'll be back in two weeks. Bye.